Amen. So keep your place there in James chapter 3. We're going to get to uh, James 3 in just a moment. But James chapter 3 is talking about um, our speech and our tongue and the things that we say um, and how serious um, that um, can be. So we're going to talk about speech this morning. All right. And just, uh, just a little introduction before we get into the sermon. You know, a lot is made today about the freedom of speech and that we can, we're able to speak um, whatever we want in this country and you know we have we don't have freedom of speech by the way I'll, I'll explain that to you um, at the end of the sermon but a lot is made um, about having how important it is to have freedom of speech but turn to Isaiah chapter 59 you're gonna keep your place in James chapter 3 I'm gonna actually you you turn to Leviticus chapter 24 and I'm gonna read for you Isaiah chapter 15 59 a lot of uh, Americans today are just like freedom of speech and, you know, they're re we're really for the First Amendment and, and all that. But let me just show you um, before we get started um, this morning that freedom of speech, first of all, is not really biblical. All right. Um, you know, in the Bible, there are rules against saying certain things um, in even the Levitical law. And I'll read one of those for you um, in Leviticus chapter 24. Look at verse 16. And then I'm going to read for you Isaiah chapter 59 as well. Leviticus chapter 24, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall surely stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemed the name of the Lord. So what does that blaspheme the name of the Lord mean? That, that means, like, speaking. That means things that you say, your speech against the Lord. So that was in the, in, the, in the civil law of the Old Testament, that was a capital um, offense, just speaking badly against the Lord. So there clearly wasn't freedom of speech just in anything um, in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 59, I'll just read for you in verse 13. The Bible says, you know, God is upset and he's going to judge for this reason. It says, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backwards, and justice standeth far off. So here, these people are speaking against the Lord. They're saying lies. They're, they're, they're just saying things. They're uttering things, the Bible says. And, you know, this is something that God is upset about, and he's upset that there's been no judgment here. It says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it, it displeased him that there was no judgment. So here we're talking about just people speaking evil things, speaking lies, speaking against the Lord. And the Lord is upset that nothing's being done about it. All right. So all that to say this. All right. All that to say this. Freedom of speech is not something that is biblical. All right. Now, in a non-Christian society, don't get me wrong. In a non-Christian society, which is the one we are living in now, I am glad that we have the freedom to speak what we can speak today, mainly the Word of God, mainly the Gospel. In a pragmatic way, I'm glad that it exists today, all right? But the point is, when God's running the show, when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning for a thousand years, we're just not going to have, like, this freedom of speech to just say whatever we want, just to speak lies, blaspheme the Lord. Those things will be cracked down Upon. Look, I'm glad we have it today, all right? But I'm going to show you how even the First Amendment today, even the First Amendment where the, the, the First Amendment says, you know, Congress shall make no law establishing, the, uh, you know, a religion or the free exercise thereof of religion. This is where we get our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, our freedom of the press. You know, this is where we get this, that Congress shall make no law, meaning the government shall not make a law against these things. But I'm going to show you, you know, the workaround that Satan has found when it comes to freedom of our, even our religion and able to, you know, our, our ability to speak the truth of the Bible today. All right? So all that to say this. Go back to James chapter 3. Go back to James chapter 3. The things that we say are very important in our lives. I mean, there's a little kid saying that goes, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's just a lie that we tell little kids so they feel better about themselves. That is not true at all. I mean, James chapter 3 is talking about the tongue as a fire. It's saying the tongue is a deadly poison. 
It is saying that the things that we say, the things that you say, can be severely damaging to people. I mean, think about, think about just things that the Bible is against, like false accusations. I mean, can't, can't someone speaking a false accusation against someone, look, that can ruin someone's life. That can cause people to lose their job, um, even go to jail, you know, it, it be just because of a false thing that someone says. You think about things that are going on on social media and things that, this is why we don't have comments on our, on our channel. We don't allow comments because there's just all these, this nastiness and all this stuff going on. And I don't want to give, you know, trolls and all these people that would just speak fire, you know, I don't want to give them a platform. It's, it's that simple. All right. Um, I mean, people have been trolled online to the point where, you know, it's gotten to a point where um, people have committed suicide over things like this. Tell me that that words don't matter. Tell me that speech doesn't matter. Look, like I said many times before, the Bible is true whether we you believe it or not. Amen. Words matter. Words are deadly poison. You know, it, the right words or the wrong words are deadly poison. All right. So words matter and they can seriously hurt people. Look at James chapter 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says a tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, meaning it's saying so much trouble can come from the words that we say. It's a world of iniquity, meaning a world of sin. Like just the things that you say can just open up all kinds of, of sin. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. What does that mean? It means, here, here's what this means. It means what you say can literally ruin you as a person. The things that come out of your mouth can defile you as a human being. Someone could look at you and say, that is a terrible person right there. Because why? Because of the things that you say. Because the things that come out of you know, this one member, not your finger, not your arm, your tongue. This tiny little member that's maybe, you'd actually be shocked how long your tongue probably is. <laughs> you know? But anyway, I mean, just this little member can defile, can ruin you as a human being. And setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's some pretty strong words right there. But what the Bible is saying is what we say matters. We should be careful about the words that come out of our mouth, which leads me to the title of the sermon this morning. The title of the sermon is The Power of Silence. The power of not saying anything. So this isn't, this isn't even going to be a sermon about what you say. This is going to be a sermon trying to convince you to say less in situations. The power of silence. Look, I'm going to show you how silence is extremely powerful this morning. I'm going to give you four points, and then I'm going to show you how silence and just the fact that things aren't being said is literally changing our culture, and it's changing our society. And it's going to change your kids if you let it. The power of silence. Why should we say nothing? Let's look at four reasons that you personally, or four situations where you personally should say less or say nothing, and how that could be extremely powerful in your life. So I'll give you four reasons where you should say less or say nothing, and then we'll look at the overall cultural effects in America today on, on silence. All right? The first reason is this. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Why should I say nothing? Or what is, what is one area where I should not say anything? Look at what Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 9 says. Look, silence is powerful, and silence is powerful in this area. Look at Proverbs chapter 17. This is the first point um, this morning on the power of silence. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 9, the Bible says, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. Now, this isn't, this isn't, talking, about, this isn't talking about transgression a sin. This isn't talking about covering up something that's secretive and that's damaging to people. This is talking about something that has already been taken care of. This is, probably, this is talking about something that where there was a conflict, somebody did someone wrong, and it's already been done, it's already been dealt with in a biblical way. It says, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. And we see, you say, how do you know, pastor, that they're talking about 
that this has already been dealt with. Because look at the second part of the proverb. It says, but he that what? Repeateth a matter, separateth very friends. What this is talking about is somebody that would just constantly bring up past sins. Somebody that would constantly bring up um, transgression. Say two friends, two, two guys or buddies or whatever, and anytime you know, the, the alpha buddy wants to get the beta buddy to do something. He's just like, oh, remember that time you did me wrong there? He just keeps bringing up this something from the past constantly just to try to, you know, get his buddy to do something for him or, or make his buddy feel bad or, or whatever, okay? This is a terrible thing for a marriage right here. This is a terrible thing for a marriage. You know, when the Bible says, you know, to, not let, to let not the sun go down on your wrath, meaning when you have... A, a argument or a disagreement in a marriage, whether it be husband or wife or whoever did wrong, you know, you should get that right, get that taken care of right away, and then that's it, that's over. That's, this isn't something where, you know, the wife brings up to the husband, you know, two years down the road, like, oh, remember that time, you know, jerk face where you did this or whatever? I mean, that is wrong, okay? That is wrong to keep bringing up transgressions from the past. So even when maybe there's a new argument between uh, uh, spouses or between friends or whatever and you're tempted to bring up how something else happened but you know and and you don't want to bring up the stuff they've done wrong in the past the Bible says don't do that the Bible says you should be silent there you know have discretion have discretion you don't have to you know bring up everything that you know about people all right this is just talking about having discretion discretion all right maybe a friend here's another example of this Maybe a friend told you something in secret or in private. Just saying, you know, a friend was confiding in you, and maybe a friend told you that, you know, um, you know, they're having problems with debt, or they've got a bunch of credit cards, and they're worried about it or something. And then, and then you get in a group of people, and you're talking with a group of people, and the, the subject of debt comes up, and you're like, yeah, Bill has a lot of debt. He told me yesterday. So this is what the Bible is saying not to do. It's like, hey, be silent. Just because you know things doesn't mean you have to, you know, bring up everything. You need to think about how your words will make other people feel. This isn't talking about covering up, you know, wicked things that nobody knows about. This is just talking about having discretion and, and being a polite person is what this is talking about. All right? I mean, you don't have to, you know, bring up every little thing that pops into your head about somebody. You know, somebody you don't think somebody, their clothes look right or whatever, and you're just like, hey, you know, you should take care of that or you should get a better shirt or whatever. I mean, some people literally just like, if it comes in their brain, they literally just say it. And they offend everybody constantly. All right? So that's what Proverbs 17 is saying. It's just you need to think about how your words are going to affect or be received by other people. And if you're not sure, say nothing. You're not sure, hey, should I say this at this time? Would he take this the wrong way? Would she take this the wrong way? Should I bring this up? Say nothing. Default to saying nothing. The power of silence. All right, so the first one is just have some discretion. Turn to James chapter 1. Turn to James chapter 1. The first one is just have some discretion. Not everything that you think needs to be said. All right? Think about how your words are going to be received and, and taken by other people. And if you're like, I don't know how they would take it. Well, just flip yourself in the situation and think about how you would feel in that situation. That's a really quick mental exercise to do. How would I feel if I was him and somebody said that in this group of people or whatever? All right, go to James chapter, James chapter 1. Look at verse number 19. The second one is this. When should you say less or say nothing? The second one is this. When you're upset, or when you are angry, or when you are in an in a emotional state that is outside of normal, all right? Look at James chapter 1. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says this. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. This is a really interesting verse here because we see there's kind of a, a double slow here, and there's one swift. So there's something you should be very fast to do, and you should just be always quick and always willing to listen, 
is what the Bible is saying. But it says, be slow to speak and slow to wrath. It, the reason there's two is it's kind of like a double safety valve here. It's kind of like, you know, if one valve fails, the other valve will catch it. So you're supposed to be slow to wrath. Meaning what? You're not supposed to just be this person that just like just gets angry, just like, I mean, we all know those types of people. Any one thing goes wrong and you just snap and you just go crazy. And, and they just get, go from zero to angry just like that. We all know those types of people and you should never be that person. You should be someone where it takes, you know, it takes a long time or you, you know, it takes, um, it doesn't say never get angry. Okay, there's plenty of things that should make you angry, but you should be slow to anger. But let's say that one fails, and you do get angry, and you do get to wrath, maybe quickly or quicker than you should have. The Bible then says, be slow to speak. There's your next safety valve right there. It says, you should not just, you should not be, I mean, the person that is the worst is somebody that is quick to wrath, and quick to speak, meaning what do they do? They just get angry right away, and they just blurt out whatever comes to them when they're angry. That is a person who is going to just have a terrible time, and people are going to have a terrible view of that person. Because when you're angry, you are going to say what? You're going to say things that are not righteous, is what the very next verse says. It says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Meaning you're going to say things that you will regret later. I mean, we all have done this. We've all gotten angry and in an argument with whoever and said things that we later regretted. Why? Because we were angry and we weren't following this verse. We got angry. And then we said things that we were quick to speak when we got angry. Look, even if you are slow to wrath and you get to wrath, you should still be slow to speak. You should still think about, look, that wrath comes... That wrath comes, look, there is a righteous anger. Say you are righteously angry, you should still be slow to speak. Somebody does you wrong. You get into some kind of confrontation or argument, something, you should say uh, the, the bare minimum in that case. Wait till you are not angry, come back and address the situation. That's how you should handle those things. Otherwise, somebody sins against me, somebody does me wrong, and then I go and I'm quick to wrath and maybe I, des maybe I am righteously angry over what has happened, but then I'm quick to speak and I say a bunch of things. Now I'm at fault as well. Now I'm a transgressor in the situation. It's better to say only what is necessary and address it later. Address it later on. There will be times of anger in your life, especially in this society that we're living in. All right, somebody that never gets angry and never is upset over anything is, you know, that's not good. All right, that is not good. All right, look at Proverbs chapter 25. He say, but somebody did me wrong, and I just want to, I just want to get them. I just want to, I want to get them back. You know, I want to, I want to tell them what I really think about them at that moment. I just want to blurt it all out and just tell them what I've been thinking about them for a year. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 25. And they deserve it. It's these times of anger when that happens. Look at Proverbs chapter 25. Look at verse number 21. You really want to get somebody back who's done you wrong? You really want to you know, do the best you possibly can? Look what the Bible says here. The Bible gives you, you know, a way to do this. Look at Proverbs chapter 25, but it takes some self-control. Look at Proverbs chapter 25. Look at verse 21. It says, if thine enemy be hungry... Let him starve. Ah, yeah. It says, no, if thy enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. This is somebody who's personally against you. All right? This is somebody who's your enemy. We're not talking about enemies of God here. We're talking about somebody that you know, you're in a conflict with, somebody that's against you personally. It says, hey, give him water. Give him, you know, it, why? Look at verse 22. And this works, by the way. For thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord shall reward thee. So there's a double benefit for you right there. It says the Lord will be happy for you if you don't just get in the flesh and just attack them back and go after them with, you know, what you do and also what you say. It says you're just going to you're going to drive them nuts is what's going to happen. Somebody that's against you, you know what that you know what that's saying? It's saying that somebody that's against you and is trying to provoke you into conflict, they want you to get down in the mud with them. 
They want you down in the dirt with them. It's their goal. But if you're just like, oh, you know, you're just friendly to them. You're just, you know, what can I do for you? And what can I do to make things better for you? You're going to drive them crazy and the Lord will reward you. It's a double benefit for you right there. So look, don't speak out quickly in wrath. When you're in an emotional state that is not normal, where you're, you know, extremely sad or extremely mad or just something crazy is going on in your life, you know, wait, don't say anything. The worst thing you can do is just speak the first thing that comes into your mind. So that's the second reason to be silent right there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25, look at verse number 23. You're already in verse 22. Look one verse over. Here's another reason to be silent. Voicing disapproval. You say, what? Voicing disapproval? Yes, you can voice disapproval through silence. Look at verse 23 of Proverbs 25. The Bible says, the north wind driveth away rain. So doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. The Bible is saying here is that if you don't approve of what somebody is saying, somebody is in a, you're in a situation where you're with a person or you're in a group of people and somebody says something inappropriate, they're backbiting somebody, it says just the look on your face is enough. This is, a, this is one that, that goes with worldly situations that many times men will find themselves in at, at work, out in the world. You know, you find yourself in a situation where you're, you're in a meeting or you're talking to a bunch of people, you know, at your job or wherever it is, and a bunch of people start talking about something inappropriate, and guess what? Silence works. Just being silent and just leaving the situation speaks volumes in those types of situations. You know, a lot of people are just like, they're all upset. People get in situations and people start talking about whether it be their weekends or just, you know, drinking. It's always drinking. People start talking about just inappropriate things that they're into and people will think that, oh, I need to say something clever here. It's like, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything clever. You don't have to say something smart. The smartest thing is to be quiet and exit the situation. And that speaks volumes to people. The best thing in many situations like that is to simply say nothing. What if somebody addresses you with something that is totally inappropriate? What if somebody comes up to you and just says, what do you think about this? And they show you something completely inappropriate First of all, like whenever somebody like brings their phone and like tries, it's just say, I don't like people showing me stuff on their phones before they even get to me. <laughs> I mean, not in church, that's different. But I'm just saying like out in the world, I, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. But what if somebody addresses you specifically where like they're literally telling you something or asking you something? You know, I, always, I have this saying that I'll say in situations like that where I'll just say, nothing I could say would be appropriate right now. And then I'll just exit the situation. That way I don't have to say really anything. But they know that I do not believe that it's appropriate. And guess what? You do these things, you express silence in these situations. You express, you know, that you're just, you express with, with the countenance on your face, with the silence, and then exiting the situation. People will stop doing these things around you. They may think you're boring or they may think, you know, you're, you're a prude or whatever it is, great. That's my view. Wonderful. Love it. But, you know, you don't have to go out and just start lecturing people out in the world. Like, these are worldly people. People you work with are worldly people. It, they're going to they're gonna be worldly. You know, just I try not to get into personal conversations in worldly situations, but every now and then you find yourself in one where it goes sideways or whatever, I say nothing, and I exit. And it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. So that's the third one. If you don't know what to say, something's inappropriate, you can express your disapproval through the countenance in your face without saying a word. Turn to Judges chapter 11. Here's a big one. Here's another one you should be silent on. This is a big one, and this will affect you. This will affect what people think of you. This will affect your reputation. This will affect 
your name, turn to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11, of course, is one of the most messed up stories in the Bible. All the messed up, all the really messed up stuff's in Judges. But Judges chapter 11 is a story of Jephthah. Jephthah was a judge, and he went to war, and he made this promise, he made this vow, that if God would give him this victory, he would sacrifice the first thing that he saw when he went home. Look at verse number 30 of Judges chapter 11. The Bible says, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt withhold without, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So he promises to the God that I'm going to go, he's about to go into this great battle, and he promises to God, like, I, I mean, whenever we're going into tough situations in our life, I'm sure, that we, um, I'm sure that we pray and say, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do this. And I mean, this isn't an abnormal thing that he did here. I mean, he promises to just give God in a sacrifice whatever comes out of his house. I don't know what he thought was going to come out of his house, his dog or his cat or something. I don't know. But in verse number 34, the Bible says this. It says, Jephthah came to Mitzvah into his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. So the first thing that comes out of his house is his only child, his only daughter. And here he's saying, now I have to sacrifice my daughter unto the Lord. Look at verse number 37. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. She's like, let me just go hang out with my friends because if you're going to sacrifice me to the Lord, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have a relationship with a man. I'm never going to have all these things. Let me go and mourn that situation. And he said, go and send her away for two months. And she went with her companions, her friends, and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months. A lot of people think, what happened? And she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which she had vowed. He actually did it. This guy actually went and he sacrificed his daughter to the Lord, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. It was such a uh, remarkable thing that happened, not remarkable, it was such a uh, well-known thing that happened that they literally mourned her every single year, because her daughter killed her, her dad killed her because of his vow. Now, obviously, you say, that's a messed up story. Obviously, you have to look at these stories, just a side note, you have to look at these stories and judges in the Old Testament, you have to realize, it actually says at the end of Judges that there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So you got a bunch of people doing wrong things in the Bible. This isn't what God wanted to happen, okay? God did not want Jephthah to sacrifice his daughter. So to make a vow that is against a commandment of God is obviously wrong. He should have not have followed through with this. He should have, you know, confessed his fault to the Lord. He should have confessed to God that he made a foolish vow and he should have moved on with his life. This is why, you know, um, in Matthew 5 and other places in the New Testament, it says just let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Don't be making all these crazy vows, vowing unto heaven, vowing unto all these things. It's like just do what you say and say what you're going to do. Simply. Okay? But the point I'm trying to make is this. You need to be careful. Another place to be silent in your life is with your vows. It would have been better if Jephthah said nothing. If Jephthah asked God to deliver him and didn't make some crazy vow like this. Because you have to understand that to vow and then to not follow through, that's an extreme case. But for a man to vow, turn to Psalm chapter 15. Turn to Psalm chapter 15. For a man to vow and then not follow through, I mean, one or two times where you promise, this happens very quickly, where you are somebody that promises, hey, I'll help you with that, or hey, I'll be there, and then you don't, 
you will quickly be known as someone who your word just doesn't mean anything. This is very important to understand. Look at Psalm chapter 15 and verse number 4. Psalm chapter 15 and verse number 4. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Notice the last part of that psalm right there. You know, a lot of people will promise things, either to a friend or to family or whatever, and they say, hey, oh, I, I can do that, or I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, or, or whatever it is. They'll promise things, and then a couple of weeks down the road, maybe situations change, or maybe it's just simply it's getting closer, and they're realizing what they promised, and they just don't want to do it anymore. They don't want to help you out with that construction project or whatever it is because, you know, that was just kind of something that they said back then. Or maybe, as in Psalm chapter 15, verse 4 says, maybe their situation changed. And maybe they just don't have the money anymore to help you. Maybe they had a few extra bucks a couple months ago, but now when it comes to actually helping someone, you know, do that remodeling job, or helping someone build that fence or whatever it is, maybe you just don't have that time, you don't have that money. But Psalm 15 is saying, even to your own hurt, you should do it. He's saying, even to your own hurt, that is what God wants. So it doesn't matter if it hurts you. It doesn't matter if it's not the best thing for you at that time. It's better that you follow through on things. And you're like, well, man, I have a really hard time following through on things. Well, guess what? You should say less. You should vow less. Because when someone's talking about trouble they're in or whatever things that they need, it's very possible to just say nothing. It's very possible just to offer condolences or just whatever, but people just want to be like, I'll do that, or I'll be there, or I'll come to that, or whatever it is. It's better to say nothing than to say something and not follow through on it. Because pretty soon, you will be, I mean, I'm talking one or two times, and you'll just be one of those people where it's like, oh yeah, that guy just says stuff. People will take your words and like, they won't even take you seriously. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. That is just, oh, something came up, and yeah, something always comes up. So you have to understand that vowing less, saying less, is an option. It's a better option to say nothing than to not follow through on things that you've said. Yeah. All right? So look, I'm trying to get you to understand this morning that what you don't say is very powerful. What you don't say can be used to your benefit in many different cases. What is, and let me, I'm going to explain something to you this morning. Even in our country today, what is not said is much more powerful than what is actually said. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the media. I'm talking about propaganda. I'm talking about, you know, these, these media companies that try to, you know, communicate to people, they use the power of what you don't see to make it look like, see, what they're doing is, you know, you see this media, you see this information out there, and you see that there's this minority fringe opinion out there, but it's really not the minority fringe opinion. You say, nobody's really saying this stuff in this fringe over here. But many people are saying it, it's just being silenced. They're trying to make it look like it's a fringe thing. Did you know that, did you know that six companies, six companies own almost every single media outlet that you could even think of right now? I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about just like news channels. I'm talking about news channels. I'm talking about TV shows. I'm talking about movie studios, I'm talking about internet service providers, I'm talking about look, six companies own hundreds of these media outlets. I'll, I'll name you the six companies. National Amusements is number one. They own CBS, Paramount Studios, uh, many others. Disney is a huge media conglomerate. You like, you like the Disney Channel on TV and then Disney movies? No, 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 no. They own things like e ABC. They own things like 
First of all, Disney is probably the most woke, most perverted, most pro-LGBT that you can even think of all this list. They own ABC. They own the History Channel. You ever wonder why, like, during Easter, Christmas, there's all these attacks on the Bible coming from what? The History Channel. They're owned by Disney. ESPN. You ever wonder why, like, all these sports stuff are constantly, like, they're the, they're the tip of the spear with all the pride celebrations and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because they're owned by Disney. Time Warner, number three. Comcast, number four. They own CBS, NBC. News Corp, this is the Fox News, National Geographic. They're maybe a little less woke than the others, but they're still, I mean, you saw what happened to people that are, you know, against, you know, the war and all these types of things. And then Sony is the, is the sixth one. These six companies, you, you take these six companies, and then you take Google, and you take Meta, which is the Facebook company. And you basically have all, all the media, or all the information that is flowing into the homes of probably 99% of Americans today. Now, here's the thing. There's all kinds of independent media out there. It's just people are too lazy. People are too lazy to go outside of this box to look at it. So what you end up with is, you know, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all these things, they fall under this umbrella. Well, maybe Twitter's not as bad as it used to be, but people are too lazy to actually go and follow independent media themselves. And what they're getting is this narrative put to them where they, they hear this silence in all these areas because they're making it appear that nobody is talking about these things. So they're like, oh, there's silence. And guess what? People want to kind of be with the majority. People are sheep. People want to be with the majority. Anybody that is speaking against the LGBT community and their agenda against, you know, their agenda to, you know, um, abuse children and, and, and just attack children today, anybody that's talking about that stuff will be silenced. You're like, oh, nobody's really saying anything about it, but they'll be silenced. Anybody that talks about, you know, the, the vaccines and the dangers of all the vaccines, they'll be silenced. Anybody that's out there and is speaking, you know, the truth about this, you know, Russian war that's going on and the Ukrainian war that's going on and that's against the narrative that the U.S. media is pushing, they're, you know, they're basically speaking against the military industrial, industrial complex. Anybody that does that is going to be silenced from these six corporations. So they all may seem a little different, but what they're doing is they're literally changing the culture of our country by what? Through silencing certain things, through making it appear that there's no voice in these certain areas. Look, this is changing our culture. It's changing our elections. It's changing our entire country. We're watching it happen. Why? Through the power of what is not said or what is appearing to be not said. Because people will watch this, and they've been brainwashed by Hollywood for 70 years. They've been brainwashed by TV shows for the last 40 years. And they're being brainwashed by all these things. And they're like, oh, this is just where things are going. And they're like, they, many people probably don't even know what's happening. They don't even know that they're changing by what is not said, by just truth that is being held back from people. Look, by what is not said is extremely powerful, folks. Not only for us personally, but for our country especially. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. But this is the opposite of the Bible. The things that are not being allowed to be said today is literally the opposite of the Bible. It's the blasphemy that's allowed. It's the perversion that's allowed. It's all the, you know, the anti-God stuff that's allowed, and the God stuff is silenced. See, it's, it's an inversion of what God had in the Bible. Only those anti-God perspectives are allowed today. I mean, this shows you who's behind it all. It shows you who's behind the six companies and Meta and, and Google and all these things. I mean, it's Satan. It's the god of this world. But see, this is what's interesting. Congress hasn't passed a law. Congress passed no law. We've enslaved ourselves. We've enslaved ourselves by only by just being, being these people that just get our information from these sources. We've literally enslaved ourselves, and Satan found a workaround. 
He's like, you know what? I'll control these few sources. I will what? I'll, I will conglomerate all these different sources into just a few different denominations. Sound familiar? This is the same reason we're going to always have independent churches. The churches should be independent. Because denominations, Satan can just attack one corporation, which is exactly what all of them are, by the way. It's interesting. It's interesting. Congress passed no law, yet here we are today. Here we are today. Go back to Colossians. Are you in Colossians chapter 4? Let's go back to the benefits. Let's go back to the benefits of, let's talk about the benefits of saying less. The benefits of silence for you personally. Look at Colossians chapter 4. The first one is this. So, I hope I've convinced you so far this morning that silence is powerful. You know, what, what is perceived silence as powerful in our nation? And what is, what is perceived from you as silence, you know, is very powerful. As a matter of fact, there's situations, you know, I'm not really talking about the, the good, you know, but where you shouldn't be silent. But if somebody's being attacked or somebody's being, those are situations where it doesn't matter out in the world. Somebody's being, saying something, they're backbiting, they're doing whatever, and they're saying, maybe they're insulting somebody. Those are situations where I will not be silent. I will break my silence. Okay, but in a lot of situations, silence is beneficial. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. It says what? It says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Again, that's the responsibility that you have with the speech that you say. So your speech is always supposed to be with grace. So if you're in a situation where you don't know, where you don't know if what you're going to say is graceful, say nothing. Don't say anything at all. I don't know what to say. Silence is, in, is the best option in that case. So the first point is this. If you do practice silence in these four areas that I told you this morning, you will be likable. Someone, you will not be someone that people dislike. Not that your goal in life should be, you know, to have everyone like you, but your brothers and sisters in Christ, it would be nice if they liked you. So, you know, to be silent in situations of discretion, in situations like we talked about, you know, be someone that always speaks with grace and people will like you. Turn to Proverbs 17. Here's a real big benefit right here. People will actually think you're smarter than you are. You're like, I'm not that smart. No problem. No problem. Turn to Proverbs 17. No problem. People can think you're smart, even if you're not smart. Look at Proverbs 17. Look at verse 28. You're like, I don't know. I'm a fool. I don't know anything about anything, and I'm always making mistakes. And Well, here's, here, this is for you. Look at Proverbs 17 and verse 28. Proverbs 17, verse number 28 the second benefit to being silent more often is that people will think you are smarter than you actually are. Look at Proverbs 17, 28. The Bible says, even a fool. He's using an extreme case here, right? Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. You're in a group of people, and people are talking about a bunch of stuff you don't know about, and you're like, man, they're talking about a... I've been in this situation like a million times in my life. You're talking about you're in a group full of really smart people, and they're all talking about all these technical topics, and, and maybe you're not an expert on these topics. And you know what you do? You shut up and you listen. You just be quiet. You be quiet. In Proverbs 29, verse number 11, it says, you know, the opposite of this in Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. So it's saying the opposite of this. You're in a group of people, and they're all talking, and you're not an expert on it, the worst thing you could do is just start to pretend like you're the expert. Start to pretend like, you know, uh, you know everything about it. It's like, because everyone's just going to look at you and they'll be like, this guy's a moron. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. They're going to know right away. So just be silent is all you have to do. You don't have to think of anything smart to say. You'll see that all the time. People are trying to think of the smart thing to say. It's like, say nothing. That's the smart thing to say in that case. But it says a fool uttereth everything that comes to his mind. This is why you see kids, they talk a lot. Kids need to be taught this. Kids need to be taught this. I tell my kids all the time, and I've told my, even my older kids when they were younger, hey, when you sit down, when you sit down in a group of, of, of older men, you know, kids that are the seven, eight, nine years old, whatever. I think it's good, by the way, when a group of men sit around at, at the at late night at the church and a group of men sit around and they talk about things. I think it's good that the young men sit down. 
I think it's good that the kids sit down and listen to the things that the, the, the Christian mature men are talking about. That's good. That's a good thing. But they should do what? They should, they should listen. And you have to teach your kids that. Because, you know, your kids will sit down in those situations when they're 10, and the men will be talking about politics or whatever it is out in the world and all this, and the kids will be like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I had a, you know, a draw, I drew that picture. Or whatever. You know, they'll just start talking about things like, hey, you should, you can go play, that's fine, but if you're going to sit down in this group of people, you should listen. I remember after, like, Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas dinners and things like that um, at my house when I was growing up, the men, my uncles and my grandpa and my dad would always sit around for hours after the, after the dinner was over, and they would just sit there and talk about all these things. And I'm just a, a little kid. I'm just like, what are they talking about? I just remember the first time that I actually had the desire to sit down and listen, and I just got to, and I got to sit with them. And I just, you know, but I didn't say anything. I just sat there and I just listened. And that's, that's a good thing for young men to sit down and listen to the old, but they should, they should listen. They should not just sit there. And kids will just, by, by nature, if they're not taught to listen, they'll just utter everything in their mind, right? They just have a thought come in their mind, and they just utter everything, right? But that's the nature of children, right? They need to learn to be mature. But you have an adult that does that type of thing, the Bible calls that person a fool, all right? So we want to make sure our kids don't turn into that adult, that just something comes into their head and they just utter it no matter what, all right? So look, the takeaway this morning is that silence is powerful. Silence is powerful. You do not have to be the one saying smart things all the time. There are times in your life you don't have to come up with the, 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 the coolest quip or the, the, the best response to people and all this. Just move past that in your life. Just be quiet. Just be silent. I mean, silence is the answer to 99% of conversational difficulties that you have. I don't know how to react. I don't know how to do this. Just be silent. Because it's much better to be silent than to say something that is wrong and walk away from conversations or walk away from somebody or walk away from an argument and be like, I shouldn't have said that. Because you can't put that back in. Once you've said it, once you've let the iniquity out, now you're into Matthew 18 and conflict resolution and taking care of all these things, which with your brothers and sisters in Christ should be completely possible to, hey, I'm sorry I said that the other day. I'm sorry I said that, you know, I didn't like your shirt and that, you know, um, whatever, you know, I'm sorry I, I was angry and all this, but it's there is ways to heal those situations, but it's better to not get in them in the first place. So that's the power of silence in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.